Welcome everyone to the CubeSat final presentations. Uh, all of our students have been working hard the past four weeks and we're really excited to share what they've been doing. I'm sure they've been telling you everything they're doing all week, um, but we'll be starting shortly. So get settled in uh, and we'll start with our final presentations. Welcome to the Build a CubeSat course. My name is Madeline Schroeder, and I'm one of the instructors for the CubeSat summer program. Over the past four weeks, students have been learning about and building CubeSats, which are nanosatellites about the size of a softball. This year, our science mission was provided by Dr. Michael Brosnahan from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and focused on detecting algae. Harmful algal blooms occur when algae colonies grow out of control. In extreme cases, the blooms can color the water red, reducing sunlight and oxygen for other marine plants and producing toxins that can kill marine life. These blooms are incredibly damaging to coastal regions, both environmentally and economically. Satellite images can be used to identify how these algal blooms are affected by sea conditions like currents and other conditions like salinity and temperature. So for this summer program, the science mission was to image these algal blooms. The students worked in teams to build model CubeSats that demonstrate this ocean imaging mission. Each team member took turns moving their CubeSat in a mock orbit over several targets while capturing images and sending them back to a ground station for analysis. Today, each team will prevent their findings and plan for developing a full CubeSat mission. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're all happy to have you here. The students have been working really hard these past four weeks uh, to put together CubeSats. Uh, no small feat, as they'll explain to you in a minute. Uh, so we're going to start their final presentations. We're going to start with the Bloom Cube team. Hi, we are Team Bloom Cube. So our mission was to simulate the operation of a CubeSat in orbit around the Gulf of Maine. And we were aiming to image and locate harmful algae blooms and send telemetry and images from our CubeSat satellite to the ground station via Bluetooth and estimate the area of the blooms. Yeah, so on to the satellite design. Um, so for CONOPS, the things that we changed about the concept of operations was that instead of sending telemetry every 360 degrees, we, we decided to only send it when we detected the um, algae blooms. And we also decided to get rid of the push to GitHub part because um, we could honestly just check the images straight from the ground station. And um, we were also shooting for the minimum viable product. For our software architecture, um, for our imaging, uh, we felt that we weren't really um, getting um, as many images as we could in uh, one orbit or processing as many images. And so we decided to uh, bump up uh, capturing an image every two seconds to one second so that way we could process more and not potentially miss an algal broom. And um, another thing that we changed um, was for our ground ops, which uh, Neil can discuss. Yeah, so from our ground ops, the thing we realized is that we didn't actually need to push the images and telemetry files to GitHub. What we instead opt to do is just verify it on our own using VNC Viewer to view the images and make sure everything's okay. Yeah, so next I can talk about the CAD. Uh, so, of course, everything with the CAD was um, pretty standard. Uh, one thing that was a little bit errorous about the CAD was that everything is perfect there. So um, mass wasn't really taken into account, which uh, we can talk about our challenges with building the actual thing on the next slide. Some of our structure challenges were that the orbiter pieces were really fragile. So they would break super easily when trying to assemble the orbiter or when balancing the CubeSat on it. Neil at the end ended up duct taping the whole thing together, but it fell apart anyways. Um, another struggle we encountered was threading the side panels on the CubeSat with screws. They didn't come pre-threaded, so we had to kind of force the screws through. But if you put too much force into it, you could end up cracking the acrylic, which was not ideal. Our, our final structure challenge was arranging the interior in a way that all the wires were in place and not disturbed and like nothing would fall on the Raspberry Pi. We ended up using Velcro to secure our power bank and solar panel. So yeah. 
So these are our budgets that we calculated beforehand. And so starting off with the power budget, we use this to predict the amount of energy that would be used by the entire 10 orbits and how that affect the battery percentage. And so, as you can see, it went down approximately 1.2%. Next up, we have the data budget, which we use to figure out the amount of data that's going to get downlinked over the course of the orbits. And so this helped us figure out how long that might take and plan around that for how long we needed to run comms. And then finally, we have the mass budget, which we use to calculate the, the sum of all the mass inside of the CubeSat and the orbiter. And then we compared that to the total mass allowed, which is determined by the CubeSat 1U specifications. So the first element that we'll be talking about our software is communications. Communication is very important because if you can't communicate, um, then you can't really do much. So we created um, a Bluetooth program that essentially um, uh, on the flight computer, it keeps searching for the ground station until it finally finds and makes a connection. And um, we have it programmed so that it sends images in chunks and uh, as well as strings, which are, can be just sent in one go since they're much smaller than images. Um, and also we have um, two um, main important um, communications links that are made at the beginning, which are at boot. And it lets you know that you need to calibrate uh, the CubeSats by shaking it. And then the calibration portion, uh, that will let you know when it's done and you can start rotating the CubeSat for the orbit. Uh, and as I said, uh, the two main things that will be sent um, once it is in orbit are um, a location, which is the location of the bloom, uh, which is in degrees through a string, and the image upon bloom detection. Next up for software, we have the ADCS, which is the Attitude Determination and Control System. For this, we utilize an inertial measurement unit, the IMU, to capture yaw data. The yaw found the angular location of the CubeSat in relationship to a set zero that we did at the beginning of the orbit. And we quickly realized that the IMU sensor had some inaccuracy when capturing the location data. And so, as you can see in the bottom right, our solution was a calibration software that finds the most inaccurate readings of the magnetometer over 10 seconds, averages them, and then returns an offset. Yeah, so next I can talk about the automated image processing that happened on the ground. Uh, which was just area calculation. Uh, so by using a millimeter square to pixel ratio, uh, we calculated the area uh, through an enhanced image by like up upping the saturation or lowering the brightness, as well as putting a mask over to uh, show only the red parts and a contour just to make it easier during the testing stage to see if the color detection worked. Um, some other functions that we added into those uh, are methods. Uh, was the take method which we used to take a picture just to make um, taking a picture easier I guess through code um, as well as the color activation code which used area count functions. So we automated these functions in our script that we called scanner and so in the method image processing it incorporates all of Evelyn's methods so take here will take the image and then we cropped that large image into a smaller one that has the that's bounded into the center because we want to decrease the amount of imprecision around the location accuracy. And then it returns a true or false on whether or not red is detected. And some imaging, well, the main imaging challenge that we ran into was the color bounds. As each team member's lighting varied, like Eric would have a, sometimes a really dark room, whereas mine might be more lit up, we had to develop our own color bounds to properly try to get the red out. And as you can see in the bottom right, this is an example of my mask. And although you can see the al algae bloom clearly outlined here, there is unfortunately a lot of red false positives around this side. So here are some of our other or uh, miscellaneous challenges that we had, which kind of just span throughout the whole project. But um, starting with the most recent one, and one of uh, the biggest ones that we had was actually the night before flight day, our Bluetooth broke. And so we had a problem establishing uh, a connection, writing strings and images. We didn't know what was going on. But um, upon inspection, we realized that our Bluetooth code was actually doing some unnecessary computations which actually were the uh, were actually were the root of our problem. And so we could just easily remove those and only have the uh, most critical computations being made. So that basically fixed everything on flight two. We didn't have a single problem with that. 
Um, another issue we had um, that I think Neil mentioned earlier were uh, lighting levels. Um, and so depending on the lighting, since we all are in different environments, we kind of had to uh, create our own custom bounds and try to remember what environment we had when we created those custom bounds so we could replicate that for flight day and have a successful mission. And here are some images that we had um, on flight day. So on the left, uh, the red tabs are just the algo blooms, which are actually what we want our CubeSat to detect, take photos of, um, and send. And then on the right, um, essentially the same thing, but I like to put emphasis on um, the setup of the orbiter. So because of the distance that the CubeSat is from the um, orbiter base, we had to put a lot of counterweight on it in order to prevent the orbiter from sagging. Um, because if it did, then we wouldn't be able to get a photo of the entire map and we potentially could miss some algal blooms if that were to be happening on flight day. So the results of our flight day was that it was mostly successful. Four out of five rounds um, mostly succeeded. Imaging worked, area calc worked for some images other than the errors we mentioned earlier. Sector location unfortunately failed. Um, the code was incorrect for each sector. So that was my bad for not checking my work. Um, and round four failed due to unforeseen weather, um, but we fixed this issue for round five. Yeah, and the next slide are some flight data images that we took. Um, so with the proper bounds and the optimal situation, uh, we can see that the contour works really well um, with little to no noise, um, which can be seen by the outlined bright green lines. So the overall lessons that we learned all throughout this project, number one was test all the time, both in pieces and as a whole. We were able to pinpoint our errors really quickly this way instead of floundering through it if we tested all at once as a whole. The second lesson we learned was to communicate. We, If without communication, we would end up overriding each other on GitHub. And our idea planning went much better when we were able to collaborate on ideas. The third issue was time allocation. We learned to prioritize critical functions over small details, even if we really want to focus on those small details. And the last one was flexibility. Things don't always go to plan and we need to adapt, just like we would need to adapt in space. Yeah, so thank you for listening to our presentation and I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Thanks, BloomQ. So if you'd like to type your answers into the webinar chat, we can have our TAs ask the students those answers or those questions. Emily, do you want to go first and I'll ask the next one? Yeah, I guess my first question um, is just how would you guys, have you thought about how you would scale your project to like a real life um, CubeSat that would go up in the space in terms of like subsystems and planning and things like that? Um, well, we'd probably need a lot more testing and a lot more time uh, since this was only like Okay, well, if his connection went out, we just need a lot more testing and a lot more time because space is a lot more unpredictable than our home environments. But our CubeSat is kind of set up already with its solar panel and battery, but we definitely need more time planning. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that. Like a lot of the things that we did were um, like, we probably could have improved we definitely could have improved on if we had more time such as like for imaging I know using like a millimeter squared to pixel ratio isn't exactly like ideal or what definitely not ideal for what you want to use for a CubeSat so things like that you would have to change and like fine-tune but the basic like subsystems like ACS imaging and like I guess adding like thermal or something like that would probably stay the same yeah overall I think like overall many of the practices we incorporated into this like all the communications and lessons learned can be applied to a more general mission like if for example a real CubeSat mission we just have to like change many of like the materials and specific like software and code and so on to make sure it like truly would work. Okay is anyone else gonna have an answer? Okay um so, and like you guys were talking about time and um, what just, um, wait, what are the most difficult challenges you came across and how would you solve these given more time? And how do you think that a real CubeSat would approach these challenges? And what do you think a real, what, what do you think that 
your CubeSat wouldn't be able to do that a real CubeSat could? I mean, I think, I guess, like, again, like, the difference between having, like, this CubeSat in your room versus having it in space and, like, a lot of things that, like, a CubeSat has to withstand in space, we probably, we definitely couldn't do with, like, acrylic um, boards. So, like, space weather or something like that. Um, and I guess definitely with imaging, it gets a lot more complicated um, because there's more things that you have to kind of like um, filter out or like more things that you have to like look for. So yeah, that's my part for imaging. Yeah, and something else we did to like resolve issues was like directly onto our CubeSat. We like would SSH right into it and you can't do that when it's in space you'd have to go through the ground station so that would be something that we'd have to change uh there's a quick question from the webinar so what are your suggestions for making the orbiter more robust so reliable i guess um i think first of all um since the orbiter is made of like mdf parts you can't really like it's it breaks very easily it's not very strong so probably something that has like better material, but also like regarding just like the orbiter part, um, maybe like some way to make it like automated so you don't have to be the one turning it. So it actually turns out at like a consistent um, 360 degrees per, yeah. I think one specific aspect of the orbiter that didn't really work were like the pins that allowed you to interconnect many of the pieces and hold them together because these are like really thin breakable wood pieces that if you applied any like lateral pressure to it would just break and those pins are crucial to keeping everything together so maybe next time go with like a metal or more solid option with more support thank you bloom Cube. Uh, i wish we had more time for more questions if you have any questions that weren't able to be answered definitely send them to us in the chat and we can send them to our students so they can answer them for you later Next up, we're going to have Team Wally present. Hi, we are Team Wally from this year's Build a CubeSat course. Uh, we named ourselves Team Wally because Wally is also a cube and he also goes to space. And our team members were Kanishk, Jesse, Grant, and me. So, first up, a quick overview of our mission requirements. So, we want our Raspberry Pi 4 CubeSat to be connected to our Raspberry Pi 3 ground station through Bluetooth. Um, we want our CubeSat to do one orbit um, per minute. Uh, so when, with our 10 minute project time, we want to have 10 orbits total. And each orbit, we want our CubeSat to take images of our algae blooms and send relevant data like time, orientation, and location of, of our algae blooms um, back to the ground station. So here's also a system level block diagram. So we have our IMU, camera, solar panel, and battery all going to our Pi 4. And then that all goes to our Pi 3, which then gets uploaded to desktop and GitHub. So here's also our build materials. So we estimate that the total cost for each CubeSat was around $270. Here's the concept of operation diagrams. It shows the different states of the CubeSat during its flight. So after the on state, um, there are three subsystem self-tests that the CubeSat goes through. And then, and then it goes into its 10 orbits with images being taken in each orbit. The relevant data is sent to, um, sent to the ground station uh, where uh, the results are determined. Here's the mission software overview. Um, so in the on state, there are three Bluetooth or three self-tests. One is for Bluetooth, the other is for ATCS, and the last one's for camera. Um, the Bluetooth self-test is very important because uh, uh, Bluetooth is an integral part of the CubeSat mission. Everything is dependent on Bluetooth when it comes to communicating between the Pi 4 and the Pi 3. Uh, then there's the ADCS self-test, which has to do with verifying that the angles are stable and calibrated and needs to be consistent with our expectations. Um, the ADCS keeps track of positional data. Um, and then the camera self-test is um, when, you know, the camera is tested and it takes a photo and downloads the photo to the Pi 3. So uh, for the imaging phase of flight, uh, we start at five degrees. 
uh, and we take a picture every 45 degrees until the orbit is complete. Um, so the pi four, uh, the flight pi, calculates uh, an image offset value from the center of mass, center of mass of the masked red image, and these offset values are stored in the pi four. And then on the subsequent orbits, uh, these offsets are applied to the starting position, and they are used to calculate the location of each algae bloom uh, in the orbit. And that way we can take new photos uh, that are more centered on the algae blooms and uh, use those images to calculate the image angle, sector, and area of the algae blooms. Uh, and then we downlink these images to the ground station Pi 3 through Bluetooth and ground operators review all the images to make sure that the offset is having the expected effect. Um, in these pictures, you can kind of see the design and layout of our CubeSat. So we have the Raspberry Pi and the IMU at the bottom of the CubeSat, and um, the Raspberry Pi is connected to the battery, which is a black block um, at the top, which uh, we used Velcro to secure it to the top. And also connected to the battery is the solar panel, which you can see is laying on top here. Um, our Final project is algae bloom imaging. So you can see, you can kind of see the little red pieces um, in the orbiter setup picture. Um, those are the pieces that we're trying to detect with our CubeSat. And so during the mission, we would be spinning the orbiter around the circle formed by the pictures uh, manually um, around 10 times for the 10 orbits. So uh, here are our results. Uh, just to go through the four images on the left half. Um, so the upper left image represents uh, a photo taken on the first orbit. Uh, so as you can see, the photo is not lined up with the algae bloom and part of the algae bloom is cut off. Uh, so this is not a photo we wanna use for collecting any data about the algae bloom, uh, but what it can be used for is calculating the offset. So you can see in the upper right image, uh, it the software masks the image and finds the red values. And then uh, it uses uh, the center of mass of the masked image to uh, calculate the distance between the center of the image and the center of the algae bloom. Uh, and uh, what it does is it then converts those pixel values to a degree value. So you can see in the, um, the bottom left image, uh, we calculate an offset value of 28.3 degrees uh, for this image. And uh, then uh, in the subsequent orbit, it uh, takes the image, takes a photo 28.3 degrees later in the orbit. And what that does is it, uh, it means the algae bloom is much more centered in the image, uh, as you can see in the bottom right image. Uh, so uh, that's the overview of how the offset code works. Um, then for the rightmost image, uh, they depict uh, some of the telemetry and some of the other images uh, we've taken of the algae blooms. So uh, the telemetry includes data like what sector the image is in, um, what degree measurement the image is at, and the uh, area of the algae bloom in the image. Some difficulties we encountered included the orientation of the orbiter. So um, our program relied on the degrees the orbiter has turned. So when we started the orbit, um, one problem was that it uh, took mistook zero degrees for 3, 359 degrees. So it um, started to think that it finished an orbit when it hasn't started yet. So um, another issue was with Bluetooth connection between the two pies. And Bluetooth is really important because it lets us communicate between the two pies. And without Bluetooth, we can't uh, transmit data between them. But ultimately, we're able to downlink data for on all of our pies during the mission. And we also had some errors with the high camera. So um, one problem was when running, if the camera didn't shut off in another program, it wouldn't be able to run in a in uh, the current one. So that was one problem. And we also had problems with the camera just not functioning properly. And we also had a problem with the orbiter at times because the, um, 
orbiter we had some issues with setting it up and it's sustaining like the math of the mass of the cubesat and on the right you can see a picture of the aftermath of one of our launches so uh in review um the overall the final flight work final flight worked uh really well for most of our team um the images were clear the algae bloom area and angle and sector were found well and uh, those values were fairly accurate uh, and uh, just to go over some of the main challenges we faced was that adcs um, software orbit issue um, or initially we started at zero degrees but we found the natural noise of the magnetometer uh, constantly uh, veered into like um, like the upper 350 uh, nine 358 degrees uh, so uh, that was an issue, and uh, what we did to fix that was we pushed the start angle to five degrees, but uh, we still uh, ended up having some of those issues. Uh, Bluetooth as well, um, just to send those large image files uh, was challenging, but we managed to figure out a way to splice the images up into packets and send those and reassemble them on the ground. So uh, that ended up working. Um, so potential improvements we could have is we fix the counterclockwise ADCS issue. We um, manage orbit in a different way. Uh, also, we want to optimize the downlinking process and data transferring. Um, because we downlinked each image right after it was taken, if the downlink process took too long, the subsequent image in the sequence uh, would be delayed uh, for however long it took to downlink the first image. Uh, so. Uh, that was causing a little bit of issues with um, taking our images because it needs to be centered in the right place uh, in the image or in the orbit for the image to be, um, you know, really good and usable. Uh, and uh, yeah, overall, just more time to make the software robust and fix uh, some issues that uh, we were encountering um, with setup and, you know, having to kill some of the programs occasionally. Um, but yeah, overall, you know, really great, um, you know, really great flight, really great, um, you know, software and yeah, just a few things that we, um, are looking to work on for the future. And yeah, thank you very much for listening. And do you guys have any questions for us? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, what subsystem did you guys find was the most difficult to work with and why? And then I guess also, do you think that would translate to a real life CubeSat mission? Comms was probably the most difficult, um, just getting Bluetooth to work and having that stable connection and being able to send uh, images. Um, once it ended up working, uh, it was all right, but um, getting there was um you know we had to go through a lot of bluetooth issues so um that one was probably the most difficult and i think that would also be the case in a real set, cubesat because then the bluetooth connection would be even more important because um you can't really like ssh into your raspberry pi in space so that makes the the comms even more important we agree uh, so another question is, how would you scale what you did here to an actual CubeSat mission? Um, I'd say if we wanted to scale this to an actual CubeSat mission, we probably wouldn't be using a 1U CubeSat. We'd probably be building like a 3U or a 6U or a larger CubeSat. So I think what we'd first want to do is um, rescale all our materials. So looking at our bill of materials, we'd probably want to um, scale everything up three times or six times, depending on what we want to build. And uh, once we get our materials all bought and set up, I think it should be pretty easy to scale it up to an actual cubes mission. I'd also like to add that um, we would need to test out our power system more, especially with the solar panel charging the power bank. Um, obviously, the battery would be scaled up to something larger. But since in an actual mission, um, the CubeSat wouldn't start with uh, a fully charged battery, you need to guarantee that the solar panel would charge the battery. And that's also important for the rest of the subsystems to function and to make sure that there's enough power in the battery. Uh, I guess one last question is, how did you guys tackle the challenge of making sure all your teammates were on the same page over Zoom, given that um, barrier? 
Um, I'd say we checked in pretty often with each other. Uh, we just asked, you know, how's everyone, uh, how's everyone doing? Um, we assign tasks pretty evenly. We split up most of the work in the two weeks um, between all four of our team members. And yeah, overall, I think it wasn't too bad to work together. It was, it was, uh, it was great, actually. Yeah, we had also had a lot of back and forth um, between the team members when chances are, um, and uh, like if one of our teammates had an error, uh, then someone else also had that same error beforehand. So we were able to help each other out, um, with whether it be sharing code or you know, fixing those error messages. So overall, it was a really um, collaborative experience and great for everyone. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Team Algae Cube. Algae is a natural phenomenon that grows around the world. However, when it starts to grow out of control, it can cause many problems, harm shellfish, and even humans. And it becomes known as an HAB, or harmful algae bloom. HEBs are important for researchers to be able to find and study. So we need to be able to uh, notice where they are. Enter Algae Cube. Cube stands for Aerial Location Gathering of Algae Expansion. So let's start off with mission overview. So our mission was to simulate the orbit of an Earth observing satellite. Uh, we had to detect and capture algal blooms off of the Gulf of Maine. Each cardstock piece on the right represents an algal bloom. We did one orbit every minute for 10 minutes. Now let's go over our concept of operations. So before we start doing the orbits, we have to set up. That means put everything into place, plug things in. Then we do a self-test, make sure all the functions are working. Then we move into the orbits. Um, the imaging phase, take pictures, then we process the pictures, and then we send them to the ground station in downlinking, which is a different computer. The ground station then sends them to GitHub, the internet, and then we run contingency phases in case anything has failed, and then after 10 orbits, um, it all ends. So now on to hardware. So we had some challenges while building our CubeSat. The first challenge was the placement of our power bank. We had some issues with charging our CubeSat and threading each acrylic panel piece. Um, and the last challenge we had was overheating. A few key elements of the CubeSat are the no IR camera, the Pi 4, and the IMU. And this is our CAD model, and this depicts all the parts and the relative positions. Note that the cables are not CADed here. So uh, now let's talk about the orbiter. So unfortunately, uh, we were not actually able to send our uh, CubeSats into space. We would need just a little bit more funding for that. Uh, but the assembly process for the orbiter, the orbiter is a device made of MDF parts to simulate orbit for our testing. Uh, the assembly was relatively straightforward, and we just had to do a couple of iterations to find the optimal length and counterweight. Now we're going to talk about software. So one of the key subsystems in software is the ADCS, it's, which stands for the Attitude, Determination, and Control System. It's what allows us to move around in space and figure out where we are in space and what orientation. And so uh, the, blue, the blue chip that you see in the bottom right is the IMU. It's an inertial measurement unit. And one of the sensors it has on board is a magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field of Earth. And we're using this as a kind of digital compass. And we can use this to find out where we are in our orbit and what orientation. And the accuracy of our magnetometer is roughly uh, plus or minus 2.5 degrees. Another key important subsystem is communications. And they're very essential to any successful mission. And also, they cause a lot of problems. Here are some of the common Bluetooth headaches that we had, and a bunch of the error messages that occurred. And here is the solution we got. Just try again. Of course, we were not able to SSH into our CubeSat space and just tell it to try again. We had to make it take it as a uh, check for the, the errors and check for the errors, and then cause it to try it again. Uh, now I was talking about imaging. So um, 
for our imaging, we wanted to have images of the entire uh, playing field that we could then sort through and crop an image process. So what we did was we had our, in one orbit, we had our CubeSat take images at 30 degree intervals at the largest field of view possible. So what this allowed is we were able to capture all the images and we were able to account for overlap. And using the ADCS system, we were able to store relevant information like the central length of each image. After the images were captured, it was time to process them. So uh, you see on the very left there is the raw image. After that, we would mask it or uh, get rid of all extraneous data. And then contours, which is drawing a border around the image, the uh, cardstock or the algae. Then we calculated the angle and finally cropped the image to become exactly the size of the algae to make it easier to uh, downlink or send to the ground station. Of course, while coding this, there were many, many errors. Uh, some of the main ones were that um, the gray, the color gray, was not being filtered out, so we had to change the method that uh, we were using to filter. Uh, sometimes the color red wasn't being filtered in, so we widened the threshold for red pixel for red pixels. And of course, we got many random errors, and to solve these, we look to Stack Overflow. Uh, so now let's talk about integration. Integration is when you take all the individual parts and you combine it, so the whole system starts working as a whole. Um, this was the integration plan. It seems deceivingly simple, but we went through this loop hundreds of times fixing errors, new errors popped up, when you fix the error, another error pops up, so you have to revert to a previous version, and trust, we went through this so many times. Uh, so now conclusions and results. So, um, as you can see, these are the results of the five rounds. The fifth round, we had a hardware issue, but in the first four rounds, we were able to identify the algae bloom, take an image of it, uh, crop the image, image process it, mask it, and uh, get relevant information like the area, angle, and sector. We were four out of five rounds we were able to connect to the Pi and capture images. Three out of five rounds we were able to process the images and downlink and uh, start the code about on boot in one out of the five rounds. Um, because of a technical issue, one of the five rounds was, or a hardware issue, one of the five rounds simply did not work at all. But overall, uh, our minimum viable product was successful, and so we deemed this mission successful. So looking back on our project, uh, what went well was imaging, image processing, comms, and all of the, minute, the smaller subsystems, um, and the GUI automatic image processing, some of the extra subsystems that weren't necessary also worked well. What didn't work well, so well was um, what happened when we tried to bring them all together. For example, starting on boot, um, only worked in one of the five rounds, and integrating all of the code together caused many, many, many errors. So if we were to try this again um, another time, we would implement a code freeze, meaning we would stop changing code um, a certain amount of time before our actual mission to avoid causing more errors. We'd also have more contingency plans in case things failed, and uh, test starting on boot and test in flight conditions earlier. Uh, if we were to expand this to a real mission, uh, we would keep the same overall design process, but we would have longer intervals for each section. Uh, we would 100% test more so we can iron out those errors. Uh, we'd use higher quality and more reliable materials, and like as well mentioned, we'd implement a code freeze so that we're not scrambling in the last second. Any questions? Okay, um, how would you scale your um, your project to a real cube set if you were to like build it and like and sorry and um, what things were you able to get away with for your cube set design that wouldn't work on that real cube set? Also, you legit just answered my question. <laughs> uh, yeah, but one other thing that we could add is that. Uh, we didn't mention the the radiation and all of the, the space weather that occurs in actual orbit, and we didn't have to deal with any of that when we were just orbiting on a little thing of MDF pieces on um, in our rooms. So that's definitely something we got away with down here that we wouldn't get away with up in space. And we also would not be able to use Bluetooth. It's too, uh, too small range communication. We also have, don't have to worry about outgassing or any other atmospheric effects.
I guess another question is what lessons did you guys learn that can be used going forward for future missions and also, I guess, just throughout your academic career? Test early, test often was probably the biggest thing we learned. Um, we did a bunch of testing, but we should have, as we, as we said in that video, to implement a code freeze. And we should have, once we got into a, 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 the part, uh, we were the day before or the day of, we should have stopped changing everything and just have what we have and just, because it would cause a bunch of issues if we continued on. That's one thing. I agree. Also, we should have tested in-flight conditions much, much sooner so that we could have worked out errors um, before they happened on flight day. I think we also learned a lot of like cool stuff. Like we worked with like Raspberry Pis and stuff that we normally would have never worked with. And we also learned how to work in a team. So that was pretty cool. So I have one question. Uh, what was the most difficult technical issue that you ran into of all the technical issues? And how did you solve that? Okay, so um, I can take this one. Um, on flight day, uh, everything broke for me. So I couldn't SSH into my ground pie. Um, none of my SD cards were working. Pretty much nothing worked. And um, in, in, uh, in the couple hours that we spent trying to debug this, uh, we weren't able to fix it. So instead, um, we pivoted and focused on the other uh, orbits, the rounds that we could control, and we focused on making sure their, their code was perfect, making sure their settings was perfect, so that at least in the orbits that it would work, we were able to make sure it worked as well as possible. Yeah, and another thing that was very difficult was Bluetooth. Uh, in, the, in the video, it said we just tried again, but it's actually kind of difficult to just try again. Because when the Bluetooth fails, it causes a massive error and just stops your code, so you have to add a try accept clause. But then you can't just, oh, I caught the error. You have to try the connection again. And how do you know if it, if it, sent, if it sent the image correctly? You need to be able to send uh, a message back to the Raspberry Pi that you, that you sent it correctly. And all those issues were actually very hard to implement. Plus, we also had like a lot of things occurring concurrently, like it would be imaging and at the same time, it needs to send it a send it telemetry packet. So like like Nathan said, if one thing goes wrong, it interrupts the other process. So we have to make sure those accepts restarted both processes in parallel. Yeah, personally, I had some issues with image processing. So you know, my teammates and I, we kind of just kept reiterating or keep editing the code that we had and tried to solve it that way. Uh, I have another question. Um... Given more time, would you modify your con ops in any way? Yes, so um, our original con ops had uh, specific dedicated contingency phases. And when we um, ended up building our actual thing, we ended up building the contingency phases into our code, into those individual phases. Um, but if we had more time, we would have liked to implement those separately. Yeah, continue on what Isabel said, we would have definitely included a lot more contingencies, a lot more things when things fail, if and when they fail, that we would be able to handle it much better. Thank you all. I think that's all the time we have for questions. But again, if you have any other questions for the teams, please put them in the chat and we can uh, ask them later and have them send the answers to you. So up next, we're going to have Team Charms. Hello, we are Team Charms, or Checking Harmful Algae with Real-Time Moving Satellites. My name is Hannah. My name is Ivy. My name is Steven. I'm Rhea. And I'm Alex. So here are the general table of contents that we will review today. And to start off, we'll start talking about harmful algal blooms, or HABs, which are the result of algae colony overgrowth and can severely impact marine and land life reducing sunlight and releasing toxins are only some of these negative effects. Recent missions from Hui or the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and other organizations have used remote sensing as a more efficient way to track HAP development and enhance probe data. This is important due to our mission objective, which is to image harmful algal blooms in the East Coast region over 10 orbits, autonomously determine their area and location, and transmit useful data to the ground station. Uh, the algal blooms are simulated by using 
the red car stock pieces, and the orbits are simulated using the orbiter. And the east coast region is simulated by using the 2D pictures as shown in these two images. And these are some of the requirements our team came up for came up with for the CubeSat. So the CubeSat shall take focus images with as much resolution as the link budget allows. Our pictures are scaled to 750 by 670 to cover as much space as possible and process the images and compute the total area of each of the HABs in millimeter squared to determine and determine the location in terms of central angle and sector. It shall identify the correct sector of, of the HABs and give the location um, in degrees and the CubeSat shall also be able to transmit data to the ground station via Bluetooth. And on the next slide, um, these are some of the requirements for our ground station. And the ground station shall push data received from the CubeSat um, to GitHub. And it shall also um, be able to receive data from the ground station via Bluetooth and receive commands from the entire team. So this is our uh, mechanical design. We have one, one Raspberry Pi 4 as the main processor, one no IR camera, one IME, one battery, and one solar panel. And for the structure, we have four aluminum corner rails, um, acrylic panels, and nylon sand knobs. What's different about our design compared to the other groups is like we utilize the two extra miniature brackets to hold a battery on top of the Raspberry Pi 4. And also the solar panel is placed on top to have a 90 degree um, incidence angle for maximum sunlight exposure. And on the right, we have the CAD model of the orbiter. Uh, and for software, we split up the CubeSat into three main subsystems, um, attitude determination control system, ADCS, imaging processing, um, imaging and communications or comms. Moving on to subsystem challenges, there were two main challenges while working on the ADCS system. First, we had major trouble getting accurate yaw values. In order to fix this issue, we improved calibration by adding soft iron calibration equations and applying moving averages. The graphs on the bottom show the progression of the ADCS testing. The orange values show the raw yaw values, while the blue values show the yaw under the moving average. Secondly, we had trouble counting correct orbit numbers using the ADCS system. As a response, we decided to count orbits based on time because it is more reliable and consistent than using actual ADCS angles. Um, while working on the imaging subsystem, we encountered several problems on automating the imaging process. And the first problem was the camera focus. So the picture on the left was taken before the camera lens focus was fixed. So the solution is to mechanically adjust the camera lens with tweezer. And for further develop development, we will automate this process. And, and another problem is the lighting conditions. Um, we have to find a correct HSV color balance. And the middle picture shows that the camera picks up more than what is needed. And what we did was experiment with a variety of color balance at different lighting conditions. We tried many image enhancement techniques sh such as contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization. And also we do some autom automatic color correction using a reference image. And as a result, that was only half detected as shown in the left picture, uh, sorry, on the right picture. We also did some stuff with image calibration because we understood that each person's hardware and setup had slightly different um, changes. So we wrote an imaging calibration file to determine each individual's millimeter to pixel ratio and center offsets. You can see that on the left. On the top right, you can also see that we got some false positives from MDF orbiter parts. So we derived the distances from the center of orbit to the HAB centroids and used that to filter out blobs that were too close. So we were only able to really check the HABs instead of also having the um, MDF parts in our list. Also, look at the pair of images at the bottom. We realized that we needed a way to tell the system that two photos taken at different angles are still showing the same HAB. So we used the estimated X and Y coordinates of each HAB detected and removed duplicates that were within one inch of each other. 
For comms, we had numerous issues that required consistent testing to find, and here are some of the biggest issues that we found. Uh, one of them was random errors in connections. Um, so to solve this, we added a, a try and accept statement and repeated the connection if an error was found. Another issue was the long connection times, which ranged from 15 seconds anywhere to a minute. We realized that some of the code was redundant and we brought the time down to five seconds by deleting that code. We also encountered some errors when the Raspberry Pi thought that one message was sent when two messages were actually sent. This was solved by adding confirmation responses all throughout the code. So here you can see some images from our flight day. On the left, that's our CubeSat orbiter setup. We have the CubeSat, the orbiter, and counter weights. We use mugs to cornstarch, depending on what was available. On the right side, you can see successful hab images with the data. So this is just an example of some of the images and data that we received at the ground station and later pushed to GitHub. Although we tested our system plenty, there were still unforeseen errors that happened on flight day. However, despite the photo corruption, Git issues, and Bluetooth errors, we were still able to gather good images and data. Here you can see uh, three images of the same hab. We took them on different orbits, um, and you can see that they look pretty similar, and the data has slight variance. And these are some of the lessons our team learned throughout this um, project. So first of all, our team learned that to testing early and testing often is the most important. So we tested the subsystems separately before integration and everything ran without errors on the pies. But when we started integration, there were errors that we didn't expect. So keep testing and when you run into those errors, make contingencies to resolve those errors. Unfortunately, it's not possible to always have everything working perfectly. Um, so definitely expect the unexpected. And dividing tasks and subsystems made the project run more smoothly and quickly since we were on a time budget. So while we were working on our separate subsystems, maintaining communication is also really important for integration later on in the project. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we learned about the power of Google. Googling turned out to be faster and much more efficient than asking our instructors and TAs. However, we'd still like to take some time to thank our instructor Maddie and our TAs, Aiden and Emily. Thank you for dedicating your time and energy to helping us debug during the, our labs and FlatSat challenge. Once again, thank you, Maddie, Aiden, um, and Emily. And now it's time for some questions that you guys may have. Uh, first up, I have a question from the webinar. So um, they said, you seem to think a lot about possible cases and errors for imaging based on your home environments. Um, how would you think, how would this thinking um, be scaled up into an actual CubeSat in low Earth orbit? So for imaging, one of the important things we did was, well, we had 10 orbits and 10 minutes, right? And we had a stationary HAB. So our goal really was just to figure out where that HAB was over those 10 orbits. But I guess in real life, you'll have a satellite that's going at 90 minutes per orbit. And in those 90 minutes or a couple hours in between, your HAB is going to change locations. So you're not relying on having a set location. You have to track those changes. So I guess if we were to scale this up, we would have to integrate better, um, have more um, re reliable imaging, uh, ADCS, all of that, just so that we know the precise location of the HAB at each orbit and really be able to track these changes so it's more helpful for um, the different organizations. Um, one thing I want to add is about the hardware. Like, I think I, like we should have like better hardware, for example, like the camera. So we have to mechanically adjust the camera lens to like fix the focus. So we have like um, better quality um, camera. We're going to have like, you know, auto, like we, we kind of automate the lens focus um, fixing process instead of mechanically fixing. Do you believe that this type of science mission is feasible in real life? I think like, yeah, for sure. Because um, I mean, we, although this is like only like a simulation, like a very small scale one, um, most of the stuff, the um, code and stuff um, can be um, uh, adjusted and changed um, to apply to like um, a real life CubeSat. Um, so I think it is possible. 
Um, there's just obviously more factors that um, have to come to play. So creating more like contingencies, I think, um, would make like a real life mission possible. Another question uh, about your teamwork. I know you talked about uh, splitting up the work over people. How did you think that that could scale to an actual real CubeSat mission with a lot more people than just the five people on your team? So definitely there are going to be a lot more uh, organization between like the individual subsystems. Like even if we spread out to like different subsystems, even in those subsystems, we would have um, like different levels of um, leadership, I would say. So there would be like a, a project head and then there would be like people who are working within um, smaller groups to uh, accomplish a goal, especially when uh, these subsystems are gonna be a lot more complex at a very large scale. Continuing off of Maddie's question, how do you feel your teamwork skills have improved during this project and how so? I'd say our teamwork has um, grown in terms of trust because before like we knew nothing about each other and how we were going to put this stuff together, how we were even going to like mesh what together if we were going to get into fights or anything. Um, but after seeing like results and being able to communicate with each other like over Zoom calls and in Discord, we were able to find a sense of trust in what we are doing. Like they are able to trust that what I make will work in the end and won't actually like just blow up and uh, have the mission fail. And we're also able to like trust that it won't, we'll always be there for each other. Like if something goes wrong, someone else will try to fix the error immediately so that the mission doesn't fail. Thank you, Team Charms. All right, up next we have Team Abyss. Hi everyone, we are the group of Abyss, which stands for Algae Bloom Imaging Satellite. So first, of course, we need to address the issue at hand. Currently, uh, in the eastern coast of the United States, and particularly our focus is in New England, there are these things called the harmful algae blooms, or HABs. Uh, these impact these shellfish in the area and make them unfit for human consumption due to what is known as paralytic shellfish poisoning. This impacts the fisheries that depend on those shellfish for their uh, economic prosperity. And additionally, climate change has significantly impacted how HABs form, which is something that needs to be studied. Our mission was to create a CubeSat that's going to be able to detect these uh, red algae blooms on the eastern coast of the United States. And by completing this mission, we hope to allow researchers hypothetically to use this data and like kind of predict trends and better forecast them. And also have um, the coastal fisheries be able to be better prepared and mitigate the effects. So obviously we don't actually have the budget to create a CubeSat that goes up into space and perform this mission. But in this project, we simulated such a mission on an orbiter. So we used a Raspberry Pi 4 flight computer for our flight controls. We used acrylic body panels um, to basically make a shell for our CubeSat. We powered this using a battery mounted on some Velcro and our orbiter was made using some wooden pieces. Uh, we had some counterweight to provide some balance to our orbiter and some challenges that we faced uh, on the structure side of this project were that the orbiter tended to bend uh, from the CubeSat being on the long side uh, on its very end of the orbiter. Uh, the orbiter parts had a habit of breaking and the metal pieces sometimes came into contact with each other and is short circuited sometimes. So this is our ADCS system. That stands for Attitude, Determination, and Control System. Uh, the particular unit that we used has an accelerometer, magnetometer, and a gyroscope, which tells us the CubeSat's initial position as well as determines its orbiter, orbiter angle. So our program returns the angle and the flight path sector, as you can see in the image, and it takes a picture every 40 degrees. It writes, the angle and the sector information onto said image directly. 
Some of the challenges that we face in the ADCS system were that the gyroscope measurements had a tendency to drift by 12 degrees per rotation. So this introduced some error into our measurements. We also had issues with readings going backwards, uh, which is most likely caused by power issues. So as Steven said, once we took those images, we then transmitted those to the ground station where we then processed them to find the areas of our simulated object loops. We did this through a Python library known as OpenCV, where we were able to first denoise the image as the quality of our camera wasn't that great, and this would allow us to get more accurate readings. Then we were able to mask out just the object blooms using the color, and then we were able to calculate the area by using a proportional pixel formula to correlate the number of pixels to real world units. Uh, there was a couple of challenges while doing this, and one of the major ones was finding the right range of colors to uh, properly isolate the algae blooms. As you can see on the top right, we have a complete detection where the whole algae bloom is detected. But in the bottom right, when the range wasn't quite right, we got a partial detection so the area would not be calculated quite as accurately. Now to send these images between our flight Pi, which was our Raspberry Pi 4, and our ground Pi, which is a Raspberry Pi 3, we used Bluetooth. To do this, we had a two-way connection between the Pis so that both sides could send data to each other. This allowed us to first have the flight Pi send timed data packets to the ground Pi so that we could monitor the health of our orbiter while it was orbiting. And second, and probably most importantly, we were able to implement a missing image check. So after the orbiter sent all the images to the ground station, the ground station could check back with the orbiter to make sure all of the images were transmitted properly. And this allowed us to see if there was any missing images and then retransmit them as needed. We had a lot of challenges with this subsystem and it was probably where we encountered the most errors. Uh, for example, uh, the flight pie occasionally searched for a really long time and wasn't able to contact the ground station. And even after it did that, the data sometimes froze midway through transmission. Additionally, there was sometimes incorrect timing between trying to send and receive data, and we would end up with both sides trying to transmit or both sides trying to receive. And this is our flight day video. Overall, our flight day went flight day went well. Uh, we, accom we accomplished our mission by imaging uh, the algae blooms and then calculating the size of the algae, even though uh, it was a little bit complicated complicated to get there. We ran into some problems during the flights, but we were able to do some quick fixes to uh, make it work. Overall, the imaging worked and the image processing worked. However, the most one of the most important parts, the communications, where we transmit the images down to the other uh, to the ground pie ran into some trouble. Still, we were proud of what we achieved during our flight day. Some of the general challenges that we faced was as, uh, especially getting the software to work on everyone's pies, as sometimes not all of us have the same uh, downloads for our programs, and also working with software that most of us are not familiar with and have never used, as many of us are co uh, beginner coders, and also putting together our orbits and CubeSat without breaking anything as the wood and plastic that we use is quite fragile, and also debugging errors that like have barely any online presence, as in there's like not many resources, resources on what the errors are and how to fix them. So here are some lessons that we learned from this project. One of the primary ones is that implementing code freezes is absolutely important because this allows us to bypass any problems that uh, pop up during our tests. We also need to test code during its actual running environment so as to simulate the um, actual scenarios that the CubeSat will be under. Uh, as Ranvitha mentioned in the previous slide, sometimes errors don't really have um, an obvious solution to them and sometimes reflashing the Pi or otherwise clearing and uh, reformatting the SD card of the Pi is the only way to actually solve an error. And we should always have a way to revert to a previous version of our software because sometimes our new additions actually make problems worse. And we should minimize the number of Bluetooth transmissions because that it tends to be the weakest link and we don't want to needlessly strain uh, this particular portion of um, the process. We should also minimize late minute edits because this introduces a lot of variability and can cause a lot of problems. 
The ground station image processing could also be um, used in the real world. So for example, it could be used uh, in a real world mission similar to kind of our mission. The color detection that we use can also be uh, applied to other different other environmental changes, for example, deforestation, water, water quality, and wildlife. The data gathering that we uh, did is uh, could be used for remote locations. And then also CubeSats, we've learned that CubeSats are very accessible, which means that um, a lot of people can join this exciting field and learn more about space and space technology. And of course, none of this would have been possible without our amazing TAs and lead instructor, Emily, Maggie, and Aiden. So we want to really thank them for making the Summer Institute possible. That's all. Aw, thank you. All right, any questions for Team Abyss? Okay, my first question is, if given more time, how would you fix things that didn't work as intended during flight? I think one of the issues that we encountered a lot was we had lots of issues with communication. And I think as uh, Stephen, I think said in the presentation, we want to minimize how much we stress that Bluetooth connection. So I think we would reduce the number of transmissions that we sent back and forth between the flight pi and the ground pi. And that would ensure that the Bluetooth connection, we could still make sure we're getting all the data, but we would also limit the amount of data that we are sending. I think another aspect that we would have worked on more if we had more time was like the on boot function, because uh, with real satellites, we're not really able to see what's happening uh, on the satellite when we're on the ground. So it's a bit difficult to know uh, what exactly is going on inside the flight computer. So getting that on boot function um, solid is probably going to be something that's really important. Um, adding on, I feel like uh, for image processing, sometimes it would miss certain like like parts of the algae bloom and like would leave some parts out so definitely like spending more time figuring out like the optimal range for like our rooms and like where we're going to be running the flight another question for you guys is looking back are there things you would have done differently in terms of how you integrated all of your components i would say maybe having integrating like two certain two parts together first and then testing it so rather than having it um, integrating everything and then testing where we'd have to kind of um, fix each part individually and like all together we can have say communications and then image processing together and then we would only have to fix either imaging or communications um, and then continuing on with that so that you don't have to fix every single one um, the whole time yeah, I definitely agree with that because when we put everything together all at once, you tend to just yeah a bunch of errors all at the same time. Whereas if you had this sort of segmented integration of the different subsystems, uh, it'd be a lot more uh, manageable to handle each of the individual errors that come up and really make sure that the two subsystems that you're integrating at the time are meshing and working well together. And especially with um, putting two systems together that are contingent on one happening before the other, we should probably try and avoid scenarios or at least implement bypasses so that if one thing gets um, stuck on a particular like comms or something, it can continue taking pictures, even if the comms function doesn't work for that particular orbit. Okay. Um, another question is, what advice would you give to instructors and students of the CubeSat 2023 class regarding the CubeSat project or the course in general? Um, to me, I, you can go. Oh, okay. Definitely uh, don't make a uh, day of edits. So, like on flight day, don't make your like code edits and like finishing your code um, like a like, day or two before so you have more time to test and not like run into last minute errors. I think another thing that I would definitely say is uh, while this is something that's really difficult, I would say don't take yourself too seriously. At the end of the day, this is a summer camp, and I think we're all here to both learn and have fun in equal parts. Yes, you should accomplish everything that you have to do, but at the end of the day, you should also focus on enjoying yourself. So that's something that I think we were really able to do in this course, and I personally had a lot of fun. So that's what I would tell to any students. You should focus on learning, but also remember to have fun.
you know, especially I'm on the coding bit. Um, don't, uh, don't be intimidated by the coding because I came into this program with basically zero programming experience. So that was something that I, you know, really struggled with coming into this program. But really, um, once you kind of have that drive to actually produce something that works, um, you'll be able to figure things out for yourself. So, you know, don't be afraid of taking on new challenges, especially with coding. Uh, for me, I would say, especially for like students, um, when you're coding, don't be afraid to use Google um, because it is a really useful tool. Um, when I came into this, I was like, I was, my mindset was I'm going to try and do everything by myself, like figure out each and every single problem, like how to code it. But I realized that that's not really possible or it's not going to be very efficient. Um, and the solutions uh, on the internet is are like a lot more well thought out and like better. Thank you for all that advice. Uh, we'll be sure to tell the students of the next class all of that. It's really helpful. Uh, thank you all for coming and watching. Uh, we're really proud of all of our students and I hope you can attend the final program closing later this afternoon um, where we will distribute awards for um, all the students and how well they did on flight day. Uh, so thank you for attending and we'll see you soon. Uh, that should start, I believe at 1.30 p.m.